Nicolas Tenza is a French civil servant, academic writer and editor. He taught political philosophy at Sciences Po from 1986 to 2004. And since 2014, he's taught the science of government. As a civil servant, Tenza is the former head of the Commissariat, uh, Commissariat General du Plan uh, uh, up until 2002. He's a former member of staff of France's Ministry of Economy and Finance, and he is currently the editor of the Journal Le Banquier and is the founding president of Serap a position he's held since 1986. He was a director of the Aspen Institute from 2010 to 2015 and has acted as treasurer and president for that organization. Nicola is also a member of the Ordre National de la Légion d'Honneur and the Order des Arts et des Lettres. Uh, again, apologies for my pronunciation. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. All our content is now all available, also available on popular podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please do like and subscribe and share links to the videos to help new people discover the fantastic speakers. Nicola, welcome back. This is the second time I've had the great privilege to speak to you. Thank you, Jonathan. It's always my pleasure to talk to you. Um, we're going to dive into a wide range of topics. There is an overarching theme, however, and that is Ukrainian victory and why it is so important, not just to Ukraine, but to those in the West as well. Well, we'll, we'll come on to that in a second. But the first question I want to ask is, what is the most plausible set of reasons or single reason why Putin launched this full scale war in February 2022? Oh, well, I think there are many different kind of reasons, but I think that the first reason is that basically uh, Putin is moved by the kind of ideology of destructions. Uh, he doesn't want to have a kind of stable order. Uh, of course, it could see we could see, you know, some neo-imperialist or neo-colonialist stance, you know, in his speech. Certainly, since a very long time. But I think that's basically uh, the scam uh, of something which is probably more important, which is basically he want to destroy everything uh, that is not Russian. Uh, and uh, even, I mean, in Russia, you know, uh, he's doing the misfortune of its own people, uh, you know, in, in economic terms, social terms. Uh, and of course, we perfectly know, I mean, the, um, the very heavy tribute, uh, you know, that the Russian people pay to the war as well. I mean, probably more than uh, two hundreds of thousands of deaths and uh, many people disabled and uh, for life. And uh, we, we perfectly know that. But I think that there is nothing very concrete. He doesn't want really to re-establish an empire because just he doesn't have the mean to do so. Because during his tenures, basically, we were witnessing a kind of impoverishment of, of Russia itself. And to be a very, I will say, uh, sustainable and consistent empire, we must be a rich country. And it's absolutely not the case of Russia. And Putin probably understood that basically he's a poor power, in fact. And I mean, the only way to assert uh, its willingness is to destroy the others. Uh, I mean, that's the first point. The second point is uh, that there is, of course, a dislike for everything that is not Russians. And either it means Ukraine basically becomes Russian and accept the, 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 the joke uh, from Moscow. And uh, I mean, this joke, of course, which means, I mean, uh, total submissions, enslavement of the people, etc., that we perfectly know. Plus, of course, genocide, uh, assimilation of the children. And we see, I mean, all the deportation of the Ukrainian children uh, to Russia. Uh, uh, or if they do not accept, they must die. And that's why what we are witnessing right now in Ukraine by Russia is a kind of war of extermination. Uh, we wa they want to exterminate. And the most the people they killed, the more happy they are. And it's an interesting tone uh, to the explanation there, because it, if you look at a lot of the so-called uh, Vatniks or those who... Um, defend directly or indirectly Russia's methods, they use some very big geopolitical concepts, that Russia is anti-colonial, that they're trying to create a multipolar world, etc., etc. Whereas 
your explanation suggests that this is more a business model. Russia is trying to create an environment where its form of mafia-driven extraction economy functions, uh, and they cannot function in a rules-based order. Therefore, they have to take it down and make it appear more like the environment where they can succeed, as you say, with their weakness. Um, do you do you do you think that's a uh, useful well, I think, idea? I think that's true, and I think, of course, that uh, if we consider, I mean, the the the, the roots of the power of Putin, and you know, and his own itinerary. Uh, it has been always linked to mafia. And uh, just, uh, I think that I already quoted uh, the, the, the book uh, from Catherine Belton, Putin's People, and she is showing perfectly with very concrete examples that uh, from the very beginning, uh, Putin has personal ties with the mafia. Um, the mafia, especially in St. Petersburg uh, during Sobchak tenures, and it was very instrumental and in basically uh, causing up to the mafia at that time. And then after 1999, basically, he, he hired people from the, 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 the mafia business, you know, uh, the Kremlins, and he is uh, surrounded by the people who are mafia himself. Is renowned to be probably the richest man of the of the world, and uh, basically that's business ma of ma that's mafia business. And even his past links with uh, with Prigozhin, uh, uh, also a former mafia boss, uh, are also very eloquent uh, and speaks volumes about you know what uh, really Putin is. And well, I think that the patterns that we 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 basically we see in Syria uh, is also the patterns that we 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 saw uh, in some African countries. Uh, in Syria, uh, in Chechnya, uh, in Georgia, uh, and also in Belarus, uh, on which uh, Putin has a full grip right now. Uh, we have the same things. And I want, I think that he wants to basically to expand this kind of uh, mafia style of ruling, um, because as you rightly pointed out, uh, I think the, the, the rule-based order, as we name it, uh, is just incompatible uh, with uh, Putin's yoke. Uh, so the best thing to do is to destroy the world and uh, to, to, to fuel all the mafia groups that we have in the world. What he's trying to do in Africa, let's say, for instance, is basically to, to have more failed state in Africa. It's not to have, I mean, some kind of uh, uh, people who are uh, different people or states who are basically, uh, you know, aligning with uh, Putin's uh, or Russia's interest. That's not the case. It's basically to destroy the states from within. And what we have exactly right now in Syria uh, is exactly the same. We perfectly know that uh, Syria is a mafia state, a narco state, more precisely, uh, with, of course, the Assad's clan plus Hezbollah, uh, you know, uh, dealing uh, uh, with uh, with uh, capital gone, uh, which is a very heavy drug and uh, creating more labs uh, to produce the drugs and to export it to other countries. And it's also a failed state. Uh, I mean, the very idea of stability, uh, and I hear some saying, okay, we, we must not uh, basically uh, uh, basically the, the, uh, dethrone Putin because there will be more instability in Russia. That's a narrative basically backed by the Kremlin that we hear sometimes in Washington, D.C. and some, and some of the EU capitals is absolutely wrong. Putin is the instability, uh, embodied the instability by himself. And as he becomes, uh, let's say his regime becomes more brittle uh, and more threats appear to that regime, is it safe to say that uh, rather than being a sort of moderate threat or even as incorrectly seen a stabilizing force, um, he may start to get more and more extreme uh, in the strategies and tactics that he seeks to deploy? Yes, I, I, I think on the domestic level, that's exactly the, the, what happens right now. Uh, uh, since, uh, I mean, some, sometimes right now, already the regime was uh, leaning towards uh, totalitarianism. Uh, it was perfectly described, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in Masha Gessen's books, uh, especially uh, who, I mean, the, the future history, who totalitarianism reclaimed Russia. And I think she, she pointed out, I mean, some very key factors, but right now it's going fully uh, totalitarian uh, with uh, the kind of system of surveillance on, on anyone 
uh, the, 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 the crushing of uh, all kind of uh, possible uh, discontents and dissents. Uh, I think that in the next elections, we won't have any longer even the, the kind of appearance of, uh, of democracy. Um, and uh, anyone that opposes Putin uh, basically is doomed to death. Uh, that we saw with uh, with Prigozhin, certainly, and that's why also all the inner circles. Uh, I put the plural because you have many different kind of circles. Uh, you know, uh, uh, surrounding surrounding Putin. If there is anyone who is trying to 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 contest and to say, for instance, law, we have to finish the war because the war is basically undermining our own interest, and probably that's what they they think. Uh, this guy will be will be not only fired, uh, but probably will fall from a window or be poisoned or have a, a heart attack. Uh, I mean, that's the way the, the mafia is functioning. Basically, you have Putin with a kind of small uh, Totorina. I mean, the, the former head of the of the of the Sicilian cupola, and basically that's the head of the cupola uh, that we have. That's it. And and one of the phrases. Uh, I mean, you talk about Kremlin narratives around fearing somebody worse coming along and certainly we see that a lot even on the pro-ukrainian side there is a narrative that seems to guide decision making and that is for as long as it takes with ukraine for as long as it takes but isn't there a risk that a long attenuated war of attrition actually works in russia's favor should our strategy be a little more concentrated a little more precise perhaps in terms of the time frame within victory should be achieved i fully agree with that uh in many of my pieces uh, especially you know on my on my strategy blog um uh, i pointed out that the speech uh, i mean as long as it takes uh is absolutely not relevant uh first of all because and we have to remind of that first uh ukrainian are dying Ukrainians are dying each and every day uh, because of our own procrastinations, of our own hesitations, of, of lack of willingness to take decisive actions. And I mean, the, as long as it takes, means basically that Ukrainian can continue to die. And in my view, this kind of narrative is just not decent. Uh, just not decent, not acceptable from a moral point of view. But I think that also this narrative is uh, strategically inept. Uh, because uh, day after day, Putin's army is reinforcing his defense capabilities, producing because of the loopholes of the sanctions that we impose to Russia and the circumventing of sanctions, the lack of secondary sanctions, um, Russia is able to rearm itself. And it's a threat to the Ukrainians. And at the end of the day, if we don't have the resolve, I mean, by all sides, the Western side, uh, to give Ukraine all the weapons is needs and all the categories of weapon it means, which means basically long range missiles, more tanks, because we have the, the Leopards, but uh, certainly not enough, and fighter jets. And if we do not allow Ukraine to strike on Russian territory itself, because we have to strike on the depths of the military. Uh, I mean, the scene of, of Russia, uh, we will won't be able to, to defeat Russia and to obtain the victory. And then uh, at the end of the day, what would happen? There will be more pressures from the Western side on Ukraine saying, OK, you have regained, let's say, uh, 10 more percent of the territory. No, Russia is not, uh, you know, holding basically, let's say, 10 or 8 percent. So you have to find an agreement. And I mean, a half defeat or half victory for Putin will be still a victory for him and a total defeat for us. I mean, basically, because it would mean that at the end of the day, 
uh, the breach of international law pays. It will mean also that there will be no punishment for the war crimes, crimes against humanity, crime of genocide and crime of aggressions that Russia was committed. It would mean also that in those still occupied territory, there will be more forced disappearances, tortures, murders, deportations of children. And that's not acceptable. And for me, we are still remaining halfway and what I would express is that the death of each Ukrainian killed is basically our guilt. Our guilt. And I think that we have to feel, and the, the leaders of the free world have to feel this, this guilt in their very heart of hurt. Uh, and I think that for me, I mean, the, the, through this kind of consciousness, that they will understand that they are not up to the job. And picking up that theme of half-hearted, half-measures, um, it does appear now that uh, Russia is able to draw upon the stockpiles of munitions from North Korea. The quality of those obviously is open to question, but there is potentially vast stockpiles of armaments. There is the potential, perhaps, via North Korea to also draw down on China's immense reserves of armaments. Um, and of course, likely they're built to similar Soviet standards. I'm not an expert on this, but they may be able to avail themselves of that. We've got the production facilities of Iran churning out drones. Russia is able to call upon a wide variety of uh, more industrialized, more capable societies that are churning out these munitions for them. Is there a parallel response in the West? I kind of know the answer to that. Um, are we or should we be ramping up our munitions productions? Because fine, we're providing hardware to Ukraine, you know, sometimes slowly, sometimes reactively. But are we ramping up our, our military production facilities to match what Russia may be able to call upon and throw into the fight over the coming months? Yes, uh, definitely, yes. Uh, I think we really have basically to, to, to step in and to develop, uh, you know, the, the, the concrete means of a war economy. Uh, my president, Emmanuel Macron, was uh, talking about war economy in one of his speeches uh, in June 2020. Uh, he said that the European countries must move towards a war economy. But then, basically, quite nothing happened. Uh, quite nothing, because of course we, uh, I mean, all the uh, all the the, the, um, the weapons industries, especially in France, basically uh, they doubled or tripled their productions of ammunition, of officers, etc., which is good. But war economy means something else. We cannot be at the same time in a war economy and say we are not at war with Russia. Uh, I mean, that's basically the take of most of the leaders of the free world. Okay, we are not basically at war. We are supporting Ukraine. We are increasing the, the productions to help Ukraine more, et cetera, et cetera. But we are not at war. From a legal point of view, it's right. But uh, very concretely, I think we have to speak more to the people, to the public opinion, and we should have done that uh, at the very early stage of the war to say basically that's basically all war. Uh, and we have uh, to help decisively Ukraine. And the war economy, in order to ramp up I mean, our productions, means very concretely that we have to transform some of the civil factories uh, to weapons factories. Uh, and we have, of course, to hire people, to recruit people, to train the people. Uh, it's something completely different. And then there will be the consciousness, you know, among the, 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 the people of the democratic countries saying, OK, we understand that we are at war. I, I wouldn't say that exactly the kind of, let's say, Israeli societies that we could have, I mean, in Europe or in the US or Canada, certainly not. But still, I think that we don't have enough the consciousness of the threats and the threats basically are multifaceted you know right now we have the threats you know from russia 
But what we, we've seen, you know, uh, in Israel with the terrorist attack of the Hamas, what we saw in Nagorno-Karabakh also uh, with uh, Azerbaijan basically uh, taking uh, without any kind of reactions, but the deep concern, etc., etc. Uh, I've been basically empty words uh, from the international so-called community. Uh, you know, the, the territories uh, in which the Armenians were living and we were witnessing there a kind of ethnic cleansing. Cleansing. We will see more the threats uh, coming from Serbia on Kosovo recently. Uh, we, we saw also what happened in many African countries, also not only the East Africa, West Africa, but also in the, in the South Africa. Uh, we had also very recently uh, the, uh, the, 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 the victory of uh, Robert Fico uh, with the help of the Russian propaganda, you know, in Slovakia. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. i can of course multiply the examples uh, so basically we can see I, I wouldn't say that russia is behind everything but basically any kind of destabilizations of the world any kind of threats and the multiplications of the conflict is also a way for russia to say well basically the free world the world based orders we say basically is under threat and that benefit Russia. And also that's a way with the multiplications of the conflict, also to distract the attentions of the world leaders and also of the, of the people from what happened in Ukraine. Uh, just take another example. I mean, the example of Syria. Uh, you know, uh, of course, we had massive attack, you know, in Syria, as we know, you know, in uh, 2015, uh, uh, in 2016, with the fall of Aleppo, attacks on, on Ghouta, attack on Homs, etc., etc. Then there was a kind of, last year, it became quieter. Of course, there was still, I mean, strikes by Assad regime and Russia on the civilians in Italy, but it became quieter. And since the beginning of this year, we are basically Assad regime and Russia stepping in and basically stepping in and attacking each and every day the civilians uh, with a lot of casualties. Uh, and I think that's part of the biggest pattern uh, that we can observe right now. And it sounds like the what Russia does here is not, as you say, generate or create conflicts from the ground up, not always, but it's more like a crowbar, finding a crack and then seeking to widen it or... Another analogy that's been um, uh, used is pouring petrol on the flames, which uh, is very effective. Do you see Europe being a strong target? We know the US certainly is with the upcoming presidential election. But is Europe a really strong target for this global uh, Russian hybrid warfare or gray zone warfare? Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, it is still. I mean, the US is as well, uh, certainly. Uh, but uh, Europe is, certainly. Uh, even if we don't have, you know, in the EU especially, I mean, all the, the, the Russian uh, channels, I mean, Kremlin channels, uh, Russia Today, uh, Sputnik, uh, and others, we still have a lot of this information. Just see what happened, you know, on X, uh, the, the former Twitter, for instance. Uh, and I think that's something very important. We still have a lot of newspapers, including in France, who have a pro-Russian stance. Uh, we have that exactly uh, the same way, uh, you know, in Germany uh, and other states. Uh, and we have also what I was calling in one of my pieces, I mean, the soft propaganda. I mean, not people saying, OK, we have Nazis in Kiev and uh, the NATO is guilty of uh, all. Uh, I mean, this kind of things that's basically uh, most of the people do not believe anymore, which is good. But we have uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, voices uh, talking, uh, you know, about, well, we have to seek peace. Uh, we must compromise. Uh, we have to understand that the long-term interest is not for the Ukrainian to suffer more from the war. I mean, this kind of very nasty and, I mean, in a way, in your minus, uh, narratives, uh, saying basically that Ukraine has to surrender. And that we are seeing more and more. And sometimes I must say that some of these phrases also invaded the rolling circles. Uh, not saying that they are, of course, uh, I mean, bought and corrupted by, by Russia, certainly not. But uh, that's why, I mean, the, the, the propaganda of Russia is very uh, skillful and intelligent, I would say, is that you have some narratives of the clearing, uh, 
uh, taken uh, again by, 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 by those rolling circles. I, I, I was in Vilnius, you know, on, on July 12th, and what I heard Jake Sullivan, and then Jake Sullivan was there, we had a conversation with him, and Jake was just saying, well, basically, we must not enter a war between NATO and, and, and Russia. Who is talking about the war between NATO? That's not the point. And we still have also some of the people, uh, you know, also in France, in uh, in Germany, uh, you know, talking, for instance, about the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, no later than the three days ago, I was in Warsaw for the Warsaw Security Forum. I was someone talking about the Ukrainian crisis. No, there is not an Ukrainian crisis. That versus war against Ukraine. Uh, and when we saw uh, Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz, uh, saying that he won't uh, deliver the Taurus uh, long-range missiles to Ukraine, which is absolutely a shame. He was talking about the risk of escalation. But the risk of escalation in this precise case is basically a Russian narrative. Uh, you see, I mean, that's what I am afraid of. Um, to have, I mean, this soft propaganda uh, invading basically the, 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 the public sphere. And also, I mean, another kind of narrative is basically, well, we have to help the Ukrainians fighting their war. No, we have to help ourselves winning our common war. I mean, Ukrainians, they are not other people. Ukrainians are European people. Uh, uh, we must not create a kind of distance between the Ukrainians and us as if it was basically us and they. No, it's basically, no, it's, it's basically the same war that we are fighting together. Uh, and you see, uh, um, basically, I, I pay a great deal of attention to the words. And I think the wording is very important because that's the way uh, basically propaganda is infiltrating our minds. Yeah, yeah you, I couldn't put that better i mean this is the one reason i created the channel was to examine language and its power to manipulate um and there's a couple of things that that, that come out of that and i i heard um Keir giles uh who i'm sure you're aware of speaking um recently he made a very interesting point and that is that we believe that russia is losing the war we believe that we uh, are able to resist Russian aggression, but he's pointed out that we are playing Moscow's rules over and over and over again. When Kohov Kadam was destroyed, there was no consequences. And that that's Moscow rules winning. When he uses, as you say, phrases like escalation, um, et cetera, et cetera, and we don't take action, we've fallen into the trap of playing Moscow's rules. So what's your view on that? What are Moscow's rules and how is it getting us to play along with them? Well, um, I, I think that, that you're perfectly right. I think that we have uh, certainly to change our narratives and of course our action. Uh, to change the narratives, I think that's not only that we have to say uh, that we uh, are helping Ukrainians defend themselves, or even that we must ensure that Russia doesn't win in Ukraine. But we have to go to a speech with this, Russia must be defeated. Not only Ukraine must win, of course Ukraine must win, but Russia must be defeated. And in fact, it must be defeated uh, in Ukraine, in Syria, in Belarus, in Georgia, in Africa, etc., uh, and I think that it's very important to have this long-term view, and then, of course, in the years and probably decades to come, to think about how to deal with Russia, and especially not to lift sanctions, exit pressures uh, on Russia, uh, even the day you know Putin will fall. Uh, and I think that's very important to have this long-term view because without Russia, as it is right now. Uh, basically, the world will be a safer place. I am not saying that all the problems will be fall, certainly not, but I think that many of them will, and there will be a kind of very positive uh, snowball consequences 
also what what happened in Africa, what happened in the Middle East, uh, what happened in Turkey, what happened in the Balkan, etc. I could of course offer a lot of details about that, uh, but I think that's very important to have the big picture. The second thing is, uh, you know, I think it was part of your question is that we have to react. Uh, you were as you were mentioning what happened with the, of course, the the, the Kakovka, you know, uh, dam uh, attack. Uh, I think it was basically an ecocide, and we have to define more precisely the crime of ecocide, and we must be sure that Russia will pay for that and will pay for everything. For instance, I think that most of the leaders of the world, even if the one of kind overture by Tony Blinken recently, which is good, uh, you know, Russia has to pay all the war damages. It was said, but I think that I see many reluctances, including in my country, France, about, for instance, the seizing of the Russian central bank assets uh, worth $350 billion. And I think that's very important to do that, to seize, of course, the fortune of the oligarch, but also in the long term, we have to be imaginative. And I think that, for instance, the Russian taxpayers could pay such an example, such a proposal, there could be, of course, others, uh, part of the VAT directly to Ukraine in the 20 years to come, probably. And I think because the Russian people themselves must feel guilty and understand that they have, and probably they must want to, 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 to have the, 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 the consciousness of that, and to pay to Ukraine and to praise R Ukraine for that. I think that's an example. And <clears throat> the other example is <clears throat> that I am a little bit afraid uh, when I see that most of the world leaders are not talking explicitly about the genocide. They are talking rightly about the war crimes, sometimes, not that often, about the crimes against humanity, sometimes about the crime of aggression, which is very important because we must have a special reductions to 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 judge i mean the 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 the, the guilty ones so basically putin and the other russian leaders but the crime of genocide we have to talk about it and i think that's very important because behind the crime of genocide according to the conventions of december 9th 1948 we have to take action we have to take action when there is a crime of genocide. And the crime of genocide is perfectly, I mean, demonstrated. We have all the documents for that. We have the evidence for that, not only because of the deportations of children, with this, according to this convention, uh, a crime of genocide, but because of uh, all the many, many facts that demonstrate that there is a genocide going on. Um, and for instance, that's also the kind of language that, I mean, the world leaders must use that only examples, there wouldn't be many others, but in my view, that's very important. And on a macro level, this is the rules-based order or, an, or a, a world order run by understood rules. Rules are accepted collectively. It does seem to fundamentally be in conflict with a kind of world that Russia wants to create. Therefore, is it a useful process, not just for us to think about Ukrainian uh, victory, but is it also useful to try and think about well, what would a Russian victory actually look like? What would be the implications, not just for Ukraine, which would be annihilated, but the implications for our values and our system of trade uh, and rule of law if Russia was to triumph in its aggression? Well, I think that uh, if there is a kind of Russian victory, even uh, as I pointed out, as kind of half victory, that would have the kind of consequences that would have had Hitler's victory in 1945. And basically no less. Of course, there are different facts. There was not, I mean, the Holocaust. There was not, I mean, of course, a lot of differences, of course, that we can, of course, uh, elaborate on. But still, it would mean that basically uh, human rights would have absolutely no value. Any kind of country could commit imprescriptible crimes, crimes of genocide, uh, war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, crimes of aggressions, 
uh, without facing any kind of punishment. It would mean that basically the international law would mean nothing. And it would create, I mean, a kind of blank check uh, for all the, the bloody regimes and criminal dictators around the planet, and you have many, basically to threaten their neighbors, uh, to size their territories, uh, to annihilate their people if they want to do. Uh, I mean, there will be absolutely no roads anymore. And we will enter then uh, a kind of, I mean, uh, not only a, a kind of anarchy, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the, the word is, I mean, uh, probably uh, not strong enough, uh, but basically a kind of chaos. And basically that's the purpose, as I was just mentioning at the beginning of our interview, um, I mean, that's basically what uh, Putin is expecting for. He is expecting to create a kind of chaos in which there is only the mafia role. And there will be, of course, Russian mafia role, Chinese mafia role, Syrian mafia roles, uh, I mean, uh, Myanmar, Zanta mafia role, etc., etc. And I mean, the, the world will be absolutely terrifying not even mentioning that there will be absolutely no fight anymore against the climate change. Uh, I mean, that's certainly not some concern. Uh, the access, uh, I mean, to water for the poor people of the third world uh, will not be guaranteed. There will be absolutely no food safety, uh, no energy, I mean, safety. Uh, all the rules of the trades will be annihilated as well. I mean, we can imagine something which is absolutely a nightmare scenario. And that's why I think the, the world leader, if they have a long-term view, must be very coherent and consistent. They must have, I mean, the project and the goal, war aims, uh, to defeat Putin fully and totally. Uh, I think that's busy. That, 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 I mean, we must have this consideration. And what I am afraid of is that most of the Western leaders do not have their long view. They are a little bit shy. They do not understand. They have some difficulties also to connect the dot and to connect, I mean, the different conflicts and the, the different kind of situation around the world, but, you know, in themselves, in a kind of single picture. They do not, they are not able to, and they must. Is there also possibly, and this is a, a question really, why Russia is treated potentially much more softly if there was a power like Russia, but a non-nuclear power behaving like this, um, the behavior wouldn't be of, allowed to get so far, I, I, I suggest. Is there perhaps an impression that decision makers have, um, administrators, even senior military people, they have an impression of Russia as perhaps it existed uh, in the 60s or 70s, in the detente period, or classical literature, you know, the, the, the classic sort of uh, soft power, cultural power that Russia uses, have they got the wrong mental image of what Russia is? I think basically we have both of the elements that you described. Uh, the wrong image of what Russia is, yes, since a very long time, since a very long time. Otherwise, they would have defeated Russia, they would have the willingness to defeat Russia shortly after the Chechen war, or at least after, you know, Georgia in 2008. Uh, they don't have, have the good, the, the, the right image. And basically they were completely buying into the World War III narrative uh, that Russia is trying, uh, you know, to, to, to push forward. So with, there is the nuclear blackmail that we perfectly know, which is, in my view, completely, I mean, uh, completely wrong, uh, completely, I mean, smokes and mirrors, basically, uh, because they do not have the mean to, and probably Putin himself uh, wouldn't take the risk, uh, because, I mean, there is only one, si one thing that is important for him, is his own life. Uh, so basically, I think that we, we must stop buying this kind of thing. And I think that uh, from what I saw in Washington, D.C., probably they are not much buying that, or maybe they are buying it less uh, than at the very beginning of the old war against Ukraine. Uh, having said that, uh, if Russia would not have been a nuclear power, it's absolutely not certain, in my view, that the Western leaders would have acted better. 
Just take the example of Syria. I mean, in Syria, there was absolutely no kind of nuclear threat. Uh, Syria was already a failed state. There was absolutely no risk to strike Assad regime, to destroy its forces, uh, to, 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 to target, I mean, uh, his uh, intelligence uh, headquarters, etc., etc. And still, Obama has refused to do so in 2013. And in my view, that was a kind of turning point in history. Uh, because had Obama demonstrated the result, not only would have saved hundreds of thousands of Syrian lives, and they matter, but also probably he would have sent a very good signal to Russia, stop now. Uh, just take another example, more recent, which is the example of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is certainly not a nuclear power. There is no nuclear threat. And still, there was a lot of failures. I mean, in uh, what uh, the US especially did in Afghanistan in terms of method, dealing with the people, et cetera, that we perfectly know, and probably no long-term strategy. But, you know, with the withdrawal of American troops, you know, in August, 2021, it was another signal sent to Putin. And that was not the question of nuclear threat. Uh, you see, that's also another example. And the third example, is also, you know, the, the Gulf country, just take another war uh, of which we are talking uh, not enough, which is the, the, the war in Yemen, which was absolutely horrific. And just take the example, we could take the example, the war in Sudan, uh, the war also in Tigray, you know, Ethiopia, etc. Basically, we, we, we had absolutely no willingness of the, of, the, of the world powers to take action at that time. Uh, so I think the idea is that we are not basically going forth on Russia because it is a nuclear power is completely wrong in a view. That's a kind of excuse, uh, but the excuse basically uh, does, does not uh, hold the line. And if finally we're gonna make a stand and say no further, this is, this is a real red line that we are willing to uh, to actually enforce, what do we need to do in order to ensure a Ukrainian victory? And by we, I mean Europe, Britain, US, and of course there is risk on the horizon with a potential Trump win and all the chaos and denigration of NATO that almost inevitably will follow that. What do we need to do to ensure and hasten a Ukrainian victory? First of all, we have right now uh, to deliver all the kinds of weapons to Ukraine. Uh, as I said, mentioned, I mean, all the tanks that we have, all the long range missiles that we have, all the jet fighters that we have, uh, we have to do so. so and I mean, uh, I mean, the, the faster, the better. Uh, we must not have, we must not procrastinate. We may not, I mean, invent uh, any excuse uh, uh, to have more delays. We have to do that right now. And especially, I would say, because of the US elections that you mentioned before June 2024. And as I'm sure, uh, and I wrote also recently a piece on that, uh, you know, I think that it will certainly benefit uh, Joe Biden's uh, candidacy. Uh, because then he will appear, not Sleepy Joe, but a kind of strong man. And uh, I think that will be certainly, you know, in the U.S. context, a true asset. He will be father of victory. Uh, and I think that will be very good for him. I mean, that's his whole interest. And I think that his advisors uh, probably must be aware of that. The second thing is, when it comes to Europe and the U.K., uh, certainly we, we have to, to transform, I mean, our economy into a war economy. Uh, let's imagine that we have a Trumps or victory or double gangers. Uh, I mean, uh, that, that that will be, I mean, of course, I mean, terrifying rude news for, 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 for Europe, because basically, uh, let's imagine that Trump or anyone uh, just to say, OK, you know, NATO is obsolete. We are leaving NATO or we are not basically we are decreasing dramatically, you know, support. I mean, military support to NATO. We are withdrawing our troops from Europe, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, uh, basically what the European can do uh, 
because uh, we have certainly we have the, we will have the means probably in 20 years uh, to guarantee our defense. But without the nuclear umbrella coming from the U.S., even if the U.K. and France are nuclear pros either, uh, they are not to, able to provide the same kind of guarantees uh, that the U.S. is providing to Europe. Uh, and that's a true problem. Then, I mean, the Article 5 has a risk. Uh, the true risk is to become null, null, uh, null and void. And that's something very important. And if we, we if the Europe, uh, the, if the EU and Europe in general, I would say, because that's also not only uh, the EU, but also the UK and one day Moldova, Ukraine, etc., uh, uh, would like to, to, to replace, I mean, the kind of uh, guarantee uh, that uh, NATO is providing right now, they would have basically to step up their uh, defense budget to six or seven percent of the GDP. I am not sure that the opinion would accept. Uh, or we have certainly to speak more. The Western leaders have to speak more to their opinion and to and to consider the risk. And that's something that we have to prepare right now. Uh, we have also to to to, to bolster. Uh, also the alliances between the European industries, uh, because no, I mean, you have uh, only lonely players uh, sometimes, uh, and that's a true problem uh, in terms of credibility. Uh, we must certainly not rely only on the US, is that true? And on that, I think Macron was right uh, since the beginning, saying, okay, we, we, we have to only to count on our own because we do not know what we, what would happen. Just imagine that Trump had been re-elected in the White House in 2020. What would have happened to Ukraine? Probably uh, Ukraine wouldn't be on the map right now. Uh, and I was mentioning, I'll see the example of red lines uh, not enforced by Obama in 2013 after the chemical attack of the Ghouta. Uh, only Francois Hollande was ready to strike. Uh, the House of Commons refused as well, uh, but basically France alone or even the EU alone wouldn't have the mean to do that. Uh, so basically, hic hordo sic salta, as we say. Uh, we have to take decisive decisions. Uh, I am not sure uh, that there is the consciousness enough uh, among the Western leaders, nor the unity enough uh, to take, unfortunately, this kind of decision right now. And of course, coming back to a point you made earlier and in, a, in an earlier conversation I had, Putin is unfortunately well aware that if you throw vast amounts of money at a problem, sometimes you can actually resolve it. And by this, I mean, he has a very cynical view of people, that he can bribe people. He thinks nobody has a price that is too high. He must still believe, perhaps, that even if he loses militarily, he can buy off the elites in our countries, uh, weaken us, um, and use that strategy over a number of years to, uh, as you say, um, extend the Russian chaos into the European space. Absolutely. I, I'm so, you're absolutely right. Uh, and I think that's why we have to defeat fully Russia. That there are many reasons for that. Uh, but one of the reasons, uh, even probably not the top reason, the top reason is the, basically the threats and the, and the assassinations on large scale of the people. But I think that's one of the other reasons. We have to do that. Uh, and, and we have also, uh, you know, I, I wrote something a long time ago. I am not the only one uh, to make the case for uh, two things. First, for expelling, I mean, uh, Russia from the UN and uh, the UN Security Council, especially as a permanent member, but also to the UN as such. And the other case was basically to declare Russia a terrorist state. Because if you have people in Europe or in the US, Canada, et cetera, or Asia, uh, causing up to a terrorist organizations, uh, they could be punished under the law. For instance, if you have someone in France or in the UK, I think it's probably the same, uh, who is uh, basically working for, let's say, ISIS or Al-Qaeda, uh, this guy uh, could be imprisoned and, and bring to court. Uh, he, will fail, uh, he will certainly face uh, many years uh, in jail. It should be the same for Russia and for all the people who are complicit to Russia in Europe, in the UK and elsewhere. 
Uh, absolutely. I mean, that 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 has huge implications. For instance, Unilever Danone, which has now left um, Russia, but there are still many multinational corporations paying taxes into the Russian treasury, uh, into the Russian war budget. Um, if Russia's designated a, a terrorist organization, wouldn't all Western businesses have to sever their relations almost immediately? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's uh, why we're, I was saying that we were not, uh, not serious about the sanctions, because we have, you know, also in the US, in the UK, uh, in the EU, and even France, we still have uh, some uh, business relationship with Russia. We should not. We must cut all the ties. Uh, it's not acceptable that you have a U.S. company and France company, Germany's company, you know, still working, uh, you know. And when you have, I mean, someone who is a propagandist, basically uh, in one of those countries working for Russia, reserving Russian money, and we have many, uh, even we, we cannot publicly sometimes disclose the name. But if Russia becomes a terrorist organization or terrorist state, then I think the judiciary, the intelligence of all our countries must launch investigations about all those people who actually uh, received, uh, sometimes legally, sometimes it's not forbidden by law right now, Russian money. And of course, uh, it must become uh, something which is a breach of the law, it's not acceptable. I would say the same, I mean, for other countries, not only Russia, uh, but that's absolutely not acceptable. And the last thing I want to say on, on that, but that's a very, that's another issue we won't have time to talk about, which is the question of the fight against corruption. Uh, and I think that we have certainly in uh, both of all countries uh, to step in uh or fight against corruptions we are very we are not serious about it i must say we are not serious uh there is too much i would say complacency uh you know about what we'll say uh, we call sometimes uh, basically criminal acts from the white colors as we say uh, and i think that's a true problem uh and i mean that uh, we have a lot of corruption in france uh, or other countries basically that is linked to foreign influence or its malign influence, I would say, more precisely. And Ukrainians uh, listening to this um, will feel heartened, perhaps, if we admit, uh, you know, the issues that we have, rather than pinning the corruption topic onto Ukrainians alone. Yes, absolutely. I think there is an issue of corruption in Ukraine. I mean, uh, of course there is. Even if I think that uh, President Zelensky is taking a lot of very serious measures, you have of excellent NGOs uh, whose uh, heads I some, sometimes know, you know, in Ukraine, basically uh, uh, launching investigations against corruption. And I am sure that at the end of the day, uh, Ukraine will succeed. And I think that's uh, really something which is absolutely extraordinary to see Ukraines also doing that during the war. Uh, of course, a lot has to be done still, we perfectly know. But I think that Ukraine is moving towards the good direction. But do not forget that we had also corruptions, other legal corruption or moral corruption, because sometimes, I mean, uh, when you have someone working for Russia, you know, in France or in Germany, etc. as I said, it's not uh, necessarily illegal. And that's a true problem, because we could have, I mean, people in those countries making uh, lobbying uh, for foreign powers, uh, not only Russia, of course. And the problem is that it must be illegal. And that's, I think that could be also a very good example because we are very demanding uh, towards Ukraine, you know, in the fight against corruption, but we have to do our proper job at home. Nicola, this has been absolutely fascinating. You've given us some extremely clear and strong actions that need to be taken in order to achieve victory. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time and insight, but also for the extraordinary articles you write, the pressure you're able to bring to decision makers. We'll put links in the video to your Substack and your writings. And I strongly recommend that people uh, really help themselves get deeply informed about this uh, struggle. 
uh, because there's so much of it covered uh, in the arguments you make within your articles. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much.